And I'm very happy to have here Pauline Four. Um, I hope I pronounced correctly. And uh, Pauline, she is um, she's, uh, a faculty in the uh, Cal Poly Aerospace Engineering Department since 2018. She has uh, obtained her PhD from the Kyushu Institute of Technology in Japan. So I assume you also speak a bit of uh, Japanese now? I do. Wow. But uh, your program that you have established, you have still given it um, um, a French name, et toi. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, so this, this program, et toi, you're going to present it to us now. But in a nutshell, um, well, you, well, your focus of your research is on the adoption and usage of space systems as an educational tool to uh, support local communities, to build capabilities and support um, sustainable space activities. So that very much goes in line with uh, what this Open Source CubeSat workshop is also about. And um, so in addition to, or really to support uh, your research vision, you have established this uh, Etoile, which is a research laboratory dedicated to the development of educational technologies for open and interactive learning via the engineering of small satellites. So, I mean, uh, your students can be so uh, uh, grateful and thankful to you that, uh, well, you, you give them uh, everything um, that they need to build satellite and uh, also in addition they get credits and they get their degree. In total you have like uh, around 40 undergraduate students right now and four graduate students so I imagine you're very busy. So I'm yeah. double thankful that you're here uh, and giving this, lec uh, this keynote lecture. Also it's your morning so good morning and without <laughs> any further words I hand over to you and we are all excited to hear your talk. All right, thank you so much, Harder, for the uh, kind introduction. And yeah, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, yes, I'm Pauline Four, and um, I went with a, a bit, I guess, a controversial title of asking whether university CubeSat programs are a pipe dream. Um, am I able to control the side myself? Yes. All right, so first a little bit of introduction. I'll be brief because uh, Arthur did uh, even a better job that I will do myself, but um, this is me at a glance. Um, and I was counting last night. So it's been 12 years I've been doing small satellite programs at university and it's, uh, it's about a third of my life. And so then I had an existential life crisis. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding, I'm fine. Um, but bottom line, I've been doing this uh, small satellite um, at university for over a decade. Um, and that's, that's the overall timeline. And then I don't ever do a presentation without introducing my bunny. Uh, so here is a, is a cute picture of my little bunny. Um, then for those who might not know, uh, so I work at uh, Cal Poly, which is a sport for uh, California Polytechnic State University in uh, the city of San Luis Obispo. And I am part of the aerospace engineering department, which ranks second um, last year or like this year um, as part as a part of public and private undergraduate institution and in that uh, department something interesting is that we have about 500 uh, students total and something to note is that Cal Poly is not a PhD granting university so that's why our undergraduate uh, student number is, is, is so much higher than our graduate uh, student number and in aerospace, actually two students out of three choose the astronautics concentration. And uh, something fun, so to speak, is that in the department we have 10 tenure tenure track faculty, but really out of these 10, only two are dedicated to the astronautics uh, concentration. So that gives us a lot of work uh, between me and my colleague. And overall, it's actually the uh, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, um, um, Sorry, aerospace engineering program here uh, in California. So um, that's kind of an impressive fist. And then uh, a little bit on uh, the laboratory that uh, Arthur said I created. Yeah, it's called Etoile. Um, I'm French, so it's a French name. Uh, I went there. But it also uh, is a nice acronym for uh, my vision and my intent with its laboratory is to create these educational technologies 
for open and interactive learning and using small spacecraft to do that. Um, we have different projects going on with uh, different partners. Something I'm going to focus on today, uh, asking whether it's really a pipe dream to have university CubeSat program, is to focus on those uh, controlled spacecraft platform for educational purpose. Also have a flight mission uh, going on called PowerSat. I told myself this was my last flight mission at the university. <laughs> Maybe if I go to the industry uh, later on, I'll do another flight mission, but uh, within the university, I'm, I'm deciding this is my last mission. It better work. <laughs> um, and this is what we're going to talk about of the difficulties of to make this flight mission um, at a university. All right, so that was a bit of the introduction. Um, so next, let's dive into the topic uh, of this university CubeSat program. And first, let's focus on, on the dreamy part of it and, and the excitement of it. So for those who might not know, um, and that might be a bit, I guess, a shock uh, for those who know um, me being at Cal Poly, but Cal Poly is uh, sometimes I refer it as the cradle of CubeSat or the, the pioneer of the uh, aerospace uh, revolution in a sense, and all the ecosystem that it brought. Why? Uh, because Cal Poly, in collaboration with Stanford um, back in the early 2000s, and developed the CubeSat design specification, which is the de facto standard for the development of this CubeSat. And uh, hopefully, or <laughs> I want to say fortunately, or maybe for some of you, unfortunately, depending on your opinion of it, uh, use it to develop your CubeSat to be uh, integrated in the dispensers and um, make sure that this is done in a safe manner. And um, by yeah, until last year, until the data of last year, there's been uh, about 1,500 CubeSat that have been launched. And so these CubeSat have had a huge impact, and not just uh, on the US uh, or just on the uh, what used to be um, the, let's say, the, the space powers like uh, Russia or previously USSR, uh, US and, and Europe to a certain extent. Um, but really, it has impacting, impacted the whole world uh, thanks to this CubeSat. And so um, I went through the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, they have a satellite database. And something very interesting is that we can see that there is a shift, uh, especially from 2009. Um, here I use 2004 because this is the first publication of that CubeSat design specification. And if we look at that date until uh, oh, like today or, or the data was until the end of last year, we can see that the number of countries owning a satellite um, kind of exploded right when CubeSat and small satellite aspect uh, were also exploding. And so there have been uh, 71. And if we take a closer look at those 71, we can see that out of those 71, 20 of those countries, their first, their very first satellite was actually a CubeSat. And so that's very interesting. And you have different programs throughout the world. Uh, Japan, the Kyushu Institute of Technology is one of them uh, that favor the development of space technology in collaboration with nations that may not have a may, may not have sorry a space program early uh, before that sorry, um, but uh, help them develop those programs and develop their first country uh, satellites, for example. I forgot to check the chat. All right, um, and then if we take a closer look at the impact of, of this CubeSat, and it's not, it, it stemmed from university, and um, yeah, originally it was to provide that hands on activities to the students and provide that first hand experience of launching into space. Um, but that it has developed into something more than uh, I'm sure Professor Prixwery or uh, Professor Twiggs may not have foreseen, uh, you know, 20 years ago. So if we look at the evolution of the of the type of mission from from their early inception till um, till 2019 on that graph, um, we can see that there is a shift, and it's not only um, uh, used for earth imaging here or education, but there's also a shift to science, right? Early on, uh, CubeSat or an university developer were looked at, oh, you're cute, you know, you're making a toy and you're going to launch into two space and, you know, you're going to be the Sputnik and just get the beacon of the beep, beep, beep of the satellite and be happy about it. But through the miniaturization of electronics and um, the overall the improvement of that capabilities with being miniaturized, then CubeSat have shown their capabilities of either technology demonstration 
or um, or um, contribution to space sciences and engineering in, in general. And uh, the graph on the right hand side, um, I took that from an article from Space News and it just showed the investment into space startups. So not just for CubeSat, but any space startups. Um, and a lot of them is driven by actually uh, launchers. Um, and But launchers have been developing like Rocket Lab, for example, for adapting to the smaller payload, uh, launching maybe more often, more of them into once, so to bring the cost of that launch down. And there is a clear um, elbow around the, the 2010s, um, and that's just been exponential there. So um, will we reach some kind of plateau later on, or is it going to increase? Uh, the future will tell. But the investment uh, is, uh, is booming. So I guess if you're thinking of a startup, uh, maybe now is the time. <laughs> there is no time like now. So um, now let's see the other uh, the other side of the coin, right? And um, yes, CubeSat and their development have um, created a lot of good opportunities and an ecosystem. Um, but there is not such a dreamy part to to it too. So in particular, if we look at a university-based program, um, here I use this graph from uh, Michael Swatwood, who is a researcher at St. Louis University. And he has a database that you can um, uh, access easily. If you look in your browser, if you type the name and CubeSat database, it will come uh, probably like the first, uh, the first um, result. And um, on the left-hand side, we can see the mission from 2000 to, uh, to, to present. So it was until the data was until 2021, I think. Um, I forgot the last months that it took the data. But it, it's really recent data. And on the left side, it's like for all the, the CubeSat mission, uh, excluding Constellation. And what it shows is what is the status of this different mission. And we can see that uh, first there is quite uh, more than a quarter of unknown. Um, and then we have a little bit of uh, dead on arrival at 15%, uh, some early loss at 8%. Nothing, um, I want to say, extravagant that seems about right for those CubeSat mission. But if we get if we take a closer look into what is being called hobbyist, which is an organization or sometimes individual that do satellite uh, for fun, it, it, used to, it tends to be just one satellite. Um, then the number, especially like for dead on arrival um, and early loss, combined with the unknown and the launch failure, increased to almost uh, three quarter now of, uh, of that pie chart. And so there is clearly something happening, um, and you can read, uh, you can read different uh, paper from um, Dr. Swartwood. It's um, it's there is a different range of uh, of reasons for that, including when you're obese, you know, doing something the first time. None of us do that <laughs> really good, and of course uh, we all learn from our mistakes and then improve from them. But when you do something only once, of course you're at risk of failing in some aspect. Uh, is high. But the other thing is that um, most of these OBAs as university, and sometimes it might be the same university, but different groups within that university. Um, and, um, and so here I took from a paper published by uh, Dr. Honore Livermore um, that that was a paper kind of like on project management of a university-based satellite program. And then extracting the challenges from, from those, um, which are knowledge transfer, variety of duties, feeling of ownership, and documentation. And that resonated very much with me and probably with some of you uh, too, um, if, if you have developed a CubeSat more than one time. And then looking at those, I was wondering, okay, so ideally, what kind of we, what do we somewhat all know that we should do to uh, prevent those challenges to happen or uh, be minimized? But then what is also the practical situation of those challenges? And so if we look at uh, knowledge transfer, uh, one of the thing is at university, we really want to tie that with the curriculum of the students to uh, force them, so to speak, to be involved in the project and uh, be motivated to give a result at the quality required in the time frame required. And so what that means for that university uh, depends on the type of university. For Cal Poly, non-PhD granting university could be senior project or master thesis, for example. However, um, you know, 
not all aspect of a satellite really is is worthy of being a senior project or of my thesis, right? There's still other criteria that we need to fulfill uh, to make it worthwhile of the student time and uh, um, I guess the reputation of your program to make it uh, to make this. So the other aspect is if we want to enter knowledge transfer, it's maybe to have permanent professional uh to support the satellite program so um that is great <laughs> you know ideally uh, but that's not practically always feasible why because uh, people we we are the one who cause the most money and a lot of times those cubesat programs tend to be running on very low cost so what that means is that we cannot pay the people we cannot even pay the students we cannot pay uh even less professionals or you need to have other scheme going on and it's an additional um, hurdle here at Calpoli just because um, we are non-PhD granting. So uh, really our main role is to teach. And then we have all the, the variety of duties, whether it's on, on the faculty side or the student side. None of us, our main job is to do a satellite. We have to go to classes, full class load. Um, and a lot of students also have to work outside, for example, just to support their education. In the US, uh, it's extremely expensive. Uh, here at Cal Poly, a, a year is like 30 to $50,000 a year. So it's very expensive. Then um, we have um, the feeling of ownership in the sense of because we have small small form factor, and some of you talked to that during the workshop, like we want to combine that into uh, at the least number of printed circuit board. But when you do that, usually what I've noticed is that uh, one printed circuit board is one person. So if that printed circuit board has different subsystems on it, that person can really feel overburdened and overwhelmed really quickly. And so from an educational standpoint, that's not great because you don't want to burn your student that you're already not paying, that those that do not necessarily uh, get credit. <laughs> and then, you know, they, they, they do that work for you at the, at the, on the satellite project. So you want to be very mindful of that and find that right balance. And then documentation is kind of um, my favorite in the sense of as engineers and especially students, we know it's not the sexy part of making a satellite, right? Nobody really wants to write those procedures, uh, keep uh, in mind what, what we did wrong and why we did it wrong and keep that in mind, right? We, we, we want to, to solder, we want to put things together, we want to go to the vibe table and all of that. So it's, a, it's an everyday battle. So, and every overall, really what happened at university is that we don't only teach the uh, technical aspect of even what is a satellite, what does that does, and what do we choose uh, a maximum power tracking, electrical power subsystem versus a direct energy transfer, for example. But it's also teaching them to be professional. And if you don't come on time, it's uh, it's not okay. Or if, you're, if you if you cannot complete, complete a task, it's all right, but you need to give a heads up more than one hour before the task is due. And all these other aspects that goes into a project management. So that's kind of the part of the, the non-dreamy uh, aspect to it. So um, the question is, <laughs> OK, <laughs> so now I kind of picture uh, that the two aspects. So where do we go from there? Um, and so for me, um, it goes back to the fundamentals. So when I'm lost, I always go back to the fundamentals. And for a university, I really I strongly argue that our role is really to educate. And we don't need to launch a spacecraft to educate. We have capabilities to simulate that experience of the full life cycle of a spacecraft without launching it. Launching is, is of course, very exciting. And to put something in space while you're at school, uh, I've gone through that myself. It's like, it, it's really exciting. But it puts a burden on the students. It has a cost that cannot be ignored. And for some program, it might be OK. And for some program, it's less OK. And so uh, it, it really depends on all that dynamic. So um, so next is, uh, this is where I'm going to make the case for uh, not stopping a uh, CubeSat program that fly missions, of course not, but making a case for an uh, educational control spacecraft platform. Um, there are different um, uh, of years going on throughout the world. Uh, of course, I'm going to talk about the one I know, which is the one we are developing here at Cal Poly. Uh, which is called Akio. Uh, Akio means star, so I have a star. <laughs> I have a star uh, theme going on here. Uh, it, mean, it means stars in too much language, which is a Native American's uh, language uh, on which uh, Cal Poly has been built. 
And so really what that aims um, is to bring that spacecraft to the classroom, to train the student on it, to be okay with it being broken without having the stress necessary to launch it, to comply with those launch requirements, the, the range safety requirements, um, or to comply with um, licensing, for example, aspect, and all these other aspect that we might not know the first time we go to the CubeSat programs, but that needs to happen and that are a burden on the development, whether timeline or even in terms of cost, uh, knowledge acquisition, all of that plays into the development of a full flying mission. And that's non that's non-negligible. And um, so <laughs> I keep clicking on my arrows, but I need to click on the screen here. Sorry. Um, so here, um, and if you want to read more about that, I published a paper for the small sat uh, workshop over the summer that is uh, accessible through their proceedings, so you can uh, read more about it. Um, but um, the idea is we have this different subsystem on the flight segment aspect of, of a spacecraft. And then at the university, with that, we have that other dimensions of um, the university being uh, divided into colleges, um, and then each college has a different uh, measure. And so um, I was looking into here, especially in Cal Poly case, but I think a, a lot of the teaching notions is uh, common throughout the world. What do we have to teach in electrical engineering or computer engineering or aerospace, mechanical engineering, material engineering, and any other engineering, or even outside engineering? We could also go to the College of Liberal Arts and look and talk about ethics or space law, for example. But looking at those, how could we relate some of the fundamentals that need to be taught in this discipline to a satellite platform, whether it's the electrical power subsystem, uh, structure, communication, attitude, thermal, and, and whatnot. And we can see that uh, there is application for that uh, platform. And so there is a, a way where we could include that platform in the curriculum, not only for aerospace, because at the end of the day, spacecraft are multidisciplinary, so we really need to work together and benefit the students, not only because they join a, a special research laboratory or club, but really being part of their own curriculum. They, while they are already investing so much of their time and their money, <laughs> especially in the US, in their education, um, they could have that full hands-on, um, learn by doing experience throughout their four years uh, or so of college, for example. And then there's the all the other aspect, not necessarily related to the flight segment, but related to uh, its interfaces. So the ground segment definition. Yeah, how do we communicate with satellite? How does mission operations look like? Um, do we send a comment? When do we send those? Um, how do we get data back? Uh, the launch vehicle aspect, all the regulations with the licensing or orbital debris, um, and then anything outside of that, such as systems engineering or project management. Project management and system engineering, um, for me, I teach, for example, systems engineering um, officially here at Cal Poly. You know, for teaching it, it's words on the slides, people don't always understand it, but people don't understand it until they actually have to practice it. And so you really need kind of that, that side project to go through that so people understand, oh, I should really write my requirements before defining a solution. Now I understand why people have been telling that to me for the last year or so. Because yes, as, a, as people, again, we are more excited about doing it than actually planning for it. And so we want to go directly into the solution. And then when we have it, it's like, well, wait a second, what are my performance that I'm looking for again? Uh, is that actually the design that I designed against for this performance? And then oftentimes we realize that no, if we haven't have uh, our requirements, for example. So there's that whole ecosystem really that can be into that platform that can be adapted uh, to uh, college education um, while being mindful on everybody's time and capabilities and kind of reducing that stress of we have to comply by a launch date or with really particular um, range safety requirements, for example, that kind of are extra and are good to know. But at the same time, that does not make you a bad junior engineer if you do not if you graduate and do not necessarily all the nitty gritty details of it. At least I, I would argue that way. 
All right, so here is just a, a glance at the first version of that uh, platform, uh, very bare. And so right now it's a structure with an electrical power system board and uh, a multifunctional uh, integrated payload processing module and um, beefed up because at that time we don't have an onboard computer or command and data ending system. So it's kind of uh, mixed between the two. Um, and then in terms of uh, where we are at, um, it's funny because I also had to revise my expectation, right? Um, myself being an engineer, I tend to overestimate what I can do within a year. <laughs> and so at first I thought that project, oh, will be done within a year. Um, but uh, here it started two years ago now, and yeah, we are not done. We just completed uh, Mac 1, and now we're working toward Mac 2 and future marks, future versions. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are very uh, early on into, into that process. Uh, but again, that goes back to learning how to manage your time, understanding the constraint that the students you're working with uh, go through, and managing all the expectation on both sides. So, but that's a fun process. Um, yeah, thus far there has been close to 30 undergraduate students being involved over the last two years, and uh, one published a master thesis and two uh, in waiting master thesis. So hopefully it gets published and then that can be shared. And then eventually uh, putting everything on the website uh, that I don't have yet. Um, so for any uh, people in the community to be able to uh, take a look at it, for example, and just use it as they want to manufacture the structure if you want with your 3D printer, um, that's possible and all that. And create your own little star. <laughs> So um, in a brief, since um, I'm, I'm starting to eat in my margin of talk here, um, just the uh, lessons learned for, for that my last decade um, in brief, no worries. Um, so it's really non, you know, making a spacecraft is not easy. I think we can all agree to that. Uh, it's a multidisciplinary in nature. And it's particularly not easy at university because of the different challenges we talked about earlier. Uh, nobody is full time. Um, the students are not even like officially engineers. Uh, so we have to, and they all can come from when this is their first year at college to their last year at college. Um, so they, there's that wide span, uh, span of knowledge. You have to do continuous training and teaching and remembering that, right, first year of college, I did not know myself what actually a satellite is and what it does and what is the, the guts of it, right? It's really rare for us to see even picture of uh, satellites uh, inside of satellites. So there's all that dimension. Then there's also the other aspect of if you do a flight mission, you need to make sure that, that your new university can support you. And um, any country has uh, export control regulations. It's particularly strong here in the United States. So we have really to be careful of what we publish publicly and what we really cannot publish publicly because um, none of us want to be fined or go into jail. And then there's the other aspect of, as much as possible, tie this project to the curriculum of, of the students being involved. Can they get credit over a quarter, two quarters, three quarters, or like semesters, depending on your system, just so that uh, they don't have to somewhat invest, invest extra time outside of already their full course load and uh, sometimes their other job that they have to pay for to be at school. Um, another thing that I think is really important is do our best, um, and of course it's easier to say than, uh, than do, and uh, I know that firsthand myself, to get the funding for, for those students in there, not only for summer or like breaks, very important, um, because now the course load tends to be lighter if non-existent, but also during the school year, again, to just so maybe they don't have to work three job outside of, um, of their education, but maybe they can work on that project, gain that knowledge while also being paid so they can really better focus while being less worried about funding, for example. And that also goes for the faculty being involved. Um, for example, buying units so uh, you teach a bit less and can focus more your energy toward the teaching and the mentoring of the students um, without uh, burning yourself down because you also have to, pay, to spend uh, 20, 30 hours in a classroom um, beside your research. And then, uh, yes, yeah, in the past year, um, a little sprinkle, sprinkle of additional fun is the uh, IC shortage, which make, it, which make it really difficult to do any development. Uh, the number of times my students come is like, oh, I have the design, it's ready for manufacturing. And as, as 
like one day later we are trying to put the order and now we have all these chips that are not available and cannot be fine and we need to redo the design and it just go for weeks and weeks so um it's kind of fun um so to speak <laughs> i have a weird version of a definition of fun um but what that means is that we need to adapt to that and we need to revise also our strategy when we develop and um and be a bit more uh, flexible on that aspect. So, so just something to keep in mind. So in summary, if I go back to the original question is, uh, so is it a pipe dream to have this university CubeSat programs? It can very much be um, by underestimating um, the quantity of work that needs to be done, right? It's not just about doing that, that spacecraft uh, or just that printed circuit board. There is way more around it, especially if you do a, a flight mission. And then um, as people, we tend to overestimate uh, the number of hours in a day. Yes, they are 24 hours, but we also need to sleep for some of them uh, and even eat. And, um, and then the other constraints that each individual has uh, in, of, of the people involved in that project. But it doesn't have to be. It could actually be just, just the dream and going back to, uh, <laughs> to, um, to being more educationally oriented, right? And so this is kind of my, my call for those um, controlled educational uh, spacecraft platform and you can use that you can teach these notions into your classroom or do a special training and i i would really argue that that will also uh, foster that knowledge retention for different type of learners all uh, right um some of us are really fine with just promo points some of us really need to put our hands into it do the mistakes and then be like oh that's what that meant that line on that uh powerpoint and then um, there's a lot of talk about, um, I feel like diversity, uh, inclusion and equity going on and being more mindful of the diversity of people. But um, when you force students to go through a research lab or a club to gain that practical hands on activity, you're really eliminating all the other students that have to work beside their classes to actually be in their classes. Uh, and of course, that's not something true on uh, different countries because the cost of education is, is wildly different. But there's that, uh, that large gaps, uh, and especially it's been really uh, shocking and str striking to me here in the United States. So. Um, Ultimately, there is a, a better case for using that into classes. So there is that large number of students, hundreds of students that can be um, trained to that and have that hands on experience against the tens of students that join a particular uh, laboratory or club activity. All right, and that's it. I made it to the end. I'm sorry. Um, I guess I, I ran a little bit uh, behind the original schedule. Um, and I'll take any question if there is any. Thanks a lot, Pauline. Pauline, this was <laughs> plainly amazing. Thank you very <laughs> much. And uh, there, there's some time lag, but uh, I, I would like to hear everyone giving a big round of applause. Yeah. And it's it helpful if you put on your microphone and we can actually hear you. <laughs> My God, I have to breathe. Um, there's so much information that you packed in this a little bit more than 20 minutes. And uh, I think I will have to watch this recording over and over again, because really <laughs> a lot of information. And you got me with the slide that said you don't have to launch your CubeSat into space because I'm totally, I totally support yeah. this. It's really cool and fun to build a CubeSat and you learn so much. Uh, but you don't need to send it really into space uh, unless you have a, a, a good mission for it. But it's also, you can put it on a balloon or put it on Mount Fuji or some other big mountain. <laughs> and you can test out, as you mentioned, you can test out everything, sending the commands and uh, the operations and the engineering. Yeah. So let's see, do we have uh, questions from the audience? We have something in the chat there was something about um do we have statistics on poly submissions i don't know how much you would know about those. Uh, on top, uh, yeah i was uh, monitoring and i, I saw people responding at the same time um so that was good uh, here are you in an analog astronaut house what is that <laughs> red is <up. laughs> not yet <laughs> you like um open open roof but you have books it's kind of uh, 
<laughs> yeah, like Mars, Mars Farm and Redmission type thing. Uh, I am not. <laughs> I'm, not <Okay. laughs> I'm not sure I would want to be, though. I would miss my money too much. Can my money come? <laughs> There's another question from uh, Jairo. Yes. Uh, so how do, how do I deal with the high turnover rate of the undergrad students? A lot of organization and logistics. Um, frankly, it, it, it sounds very cliche, but uh, yeah, 80% of the work is actually uh, a lot of organization before doing anything. And so um, plainly or like practically the way uh, I do that is um, I have a roster of my students and I record the year they are at, what they are working on, and when they do plan for grading, uh, not grading, sorry, graduating, <laughs> forget to see that here, uh, graduating and um, and then based on that, when I see they are going to graduate uh, maybe like two quarters, like I try to, uh, on Cal Poly, sorry, on Cal Poly side, we are on a quarter base. That's why I keep talking about quarters. Um, but so every quarter, I kind of go back through that. And if I see someone is going to graduate in two quarters or even like three quarters ahead, I know it's time to start doing recruitment. So we have that mentee, mentors aspect, recruiting someone junior that they can be trained with that senior person. And then by the time that that person graduates in two or three quarters, um, they should feel confident enough to take the task on by themselves. Though not really by themselves, because I have a, a rule that uh, for any sub teams, I want at least three people. Number three is my magic number. So thank you for uh, the question. OK, sorry, I was kicked out. My, my machine crashed. Uh, my computer was also overwhelmed by this uh, abundance of information. <laughs> but uh, I think Reti already uh, is ready to take over. And we're going to the, so thanks again, Pauline. Thanks a lot, Pauline. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for the great workshop. Pauline Faure, merci. We're handing over now to Red uh, for oh, wow. the lightning sessions.